All right, so uh, I don't have a clicker. I'm still here. I got one. Look at that. Bobby. I put it in my bag. That's <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll, I'll move back and forth. You know, like Give me the computer. I'll advance it for you. No, it's fine. It's fine. we got plenty of time. So uh, I put these together the other day. And, and I say this a lot. i got to quit saying this. But it's going to be kind of an adventure because I don't remember exactly what all I got in here. Uh, so we just kind of, it'll be a surprise to me too. So I've been, I've had this slide in for quite a while. 2015 weed control season. You could have done that for 2014 and probably 2013 minus the snow. Uh, just bad. Just all around bad where, where we are. So uh, I'm at Stoneville. Uh, Dr. Golden right here behind a projector. He's our, our rice specialist. We spent a lot of time looking at rice in uh, April and May. Spent a lot of time on the phone with Dr. Barber who's doing the same thing on the west side of the river. Uh, so I don't have something for, for all of this, but that's just kind of my synopsis of, of, of what we dealt with last year on, on weed control and rice. Drift is a perennial problem uh, for us, and, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. But we've had some, with the crazy weather we've had, we've had some kooky things go on uh, with, with some injury that's kind of related to environmental conditions. I don't have time to, to get into that today. And, uh, and then we just got just all around poor efficacy. A lot of that was related to the weather. We do have uh, now in Mississippi the, the first case of outcrossed red rice in Mississippi. So, so we're in that game now along with, with Arkansas and Louisiana. Hey, Beth, I don't know if y'all y'all have any up there that you know think, of. I don't think it's I don't think right. you do either. Not, not, that I'm, not that I've heard of. All right, so the, the old standard uh, for us is glyphosate drift. Uh, I was kidding Nathan Deering last week. I showed uh, a similar slide. I got the stone boy in 2006. We had 200,000 acres of rice that year. We replanted 20,000 acres of it uh, because of glyphosate drift. We spent a lot of time on our hands and knees that summer. Me and Nathan Deering and, and Tim Walker, we'd all been out of school, what time, two, two years at the time, three years. We didn't know near what we know now, but uh, we learned a lot in a hurry uh, that summer. I mean, we planted, you think about that, we planted, replanted 10% of a major commodity in a major agricultural state. Uh, so that was, a, that was a big deal. So glyphosate drift has been a problem, you know, ever since we really, since we've been growing around up ready. So this is some, this is all the way back. This is 10 year old stuff. Uh, actually did this along with, with Dr. Webster. At LSU, that's not Ben's data. I didn't <laughs> cut that off. Uh, ben was probably in middle school when we did this. Uh, so this is just basically glyphosate timings on rice. This is 2.8 ounces, so about a tenth of a, of a one pound glyphosate rate. So the reason we had this maturity timing in here, Eric was, was doing this at, at the rice station in Crowley, so they were looking at going into the retune crop uh, you know, following a drift event. So this is well established now. It was it was newer uh, at the time, but basically the later in the season we get, the, the bigger the yield reduction gets. And once you get into reproductive growth, it's pretty much, you know, you're, you're into some serious problems. Just some pictures from that. Uh, really, if you contrast the boot timing to the maturity timing. So we put you know, basically three ounces of Roundup across this, didn't really do anything to it. That stuff basically doesn't head. If you put it on its boot, it locks it down, and, and you get little, uh, if anything. Just a funny story. That plot right there, would that whole plot would look like that if I could walk straight. Uh, I noticed that on one of the earlier pictures. That's, that's back when you actually sprayed plots, or had time to spray plots. Uh, all right, so Palmer, Amaranth, uh, if you've stepped in a field in the last 10 years, you're, you're very familiar with it. Uh, we had a lot of that uh, this past year, you know, in, in various different scenarios, a lot of stuff's been sprayed right there. But so what that has led to for us, I mean, glyphosate drift, no doubt, is still a, a big issue for us. I think Tom and, and Bob and then, and then Dr. Webster in Louisiana, they see a lot more new path drift than we do. 
We don't see near the, the new path drift in Mississippi. We do see it. Uh, we look at one or two a year usually, but we don't see the volume of new path drift that, that the guys in Arkansas and Louisiana do. The thing we see uh, seem to see more of than at least guys on the prairie, uh, not so much for Tom, the areas he covers, but guys on the prairie and, and in south Louisiana, it's paraquat drift. And I was one of the ones that just pounded and pounded and pounded and pounded about having paraquat in with the, with the burn down pigweed treatment or with the pre-treatment. If you've seen my pigweed talk, you've seen my, my paraquat slides. So I guess I've partially created this problem for myself. But we look at a lot of paraquat drift. All right. How many of you that spray paraquat just spray paraquat? Raise your hand. No hands. So the problem with the paraquat drift event is you know that it wasn't just paraquat. But you also know that there was another two, if not three or four, additional active ingredients that were in there. So you really don't know what, one, you don't know if you can't ID the source of the drift and know what, what, was, what was applied in that application, then it's really difficult for you to make uh, a recommendation to the guy you're working with on, on how he should manage his rice crop going forward. Uh, well, I said that about my paraquat slides. There's one of my paraquat <coughs> slides. Uh, all right, so these are just, just a, a few that Bobby and I have looked at over the last two years. And, you know, if you look at Paraquat Authority MTZ, all right, that one, we, we put MTZ on a lot of acres in Mississippi. Uh, prefix, and in, in, in that one was actually kind of kooky because we don't put a lot of prefix out pre. But that was a Liberty Link bean field, and, and so he had his prefix on the ground. This is one of the craziest things I've ever seen for, for paraquat drift. That was, well, if he hadn't had a, a, a break that went along the north end of this place, that would have been a full section of paraquat and sonic. All right, so this was in 2014. Sonic, Dow brought sonic to the Mid-South in 2014. If you're not familiar with sonic, is sulfitrazone, which is one of the main ingredients in that authority line of products, plus first rate. All right, first rate is a pretty hot ALS inhibiting herbicide, you know, like classic, like staple, like new path, the other, the other ALSs. All right, so we didn't really know what was going to happen with this guy. Uh, but it went a long way, and it went pretty even over a, a long way. Turned out, uh, he, he did okay. He had some other management issues that, that he had to deal with later in the year that we really didn't get a good handle on exactly what that farm did. Uh, but but that, was, that was one that really left us scratching our heads. We had no idea. We had, nobody had any frame of reference uh, for what was going to happen there. This was one, uh, <laughs> man, this, this guy, you can see the corn. I left the corn cob in there just so you would know. But this is Paraquat and Lexar. This is rice behind corn. So there's that dynamic. Uh, if, you, if you've ever had rice behind corn, don't do that again. Uh, and, and so there was a, a Milo field across the gravel road from here. And, and he had, it wasn't a, a, a big chunk of the field, but it was a pretty good, it was a pretty good corner uh, of Paraquat and Lexar. All right, so you got Paraquat. All right, so that's bad enough by itself, and I'll show you that in a minute. But then you got Lexar, which is probably the baddest residual herbicide that we got. So you've got dual 2 magnum in Lexar. Well, that's fine. The rice was up. Dual has zero post-emergence activity, so there's no issue there. You've got Callisto, all right, back in, in the early days of me doing this. I, I can remember... Dr. Webster and them at Crowley, they sprayed a bunch of Callisto over the top of rice. They were trying to get it and labeled at the time, never, never quite made it. So that's not the end of the world over the top of your rice. But then you got atrazine. So what, what the heck does atrazine do to rice? And then you've got the combination of the atrazine and the paraquat and the synergism between those two modes of action. Uh, and then you've got the residual aspect of it. Uh, so, and I don't have, I have, I got another, uh, some pictures from another field 
three or four years ago, uh, we, we knew what happened to this field because the grower did it to himself. Uh, it was paraquat and boundary. And he was spraying his own bean field, the wind got up, and, and, and it went a pretty good ways. He had four 40-acre uh, precision graded blocks. And uh, we stood up on top of his sprayer and, and looked at it. So we decided to keep the, uh, the two further away from, the, from his bean field and the, and the two closest to the beans, we said, you know, we, you, got to, you got to get rid of them. Gary, I think you were down there that day. Uh, so we decided, you know, I think, I think this rice is going to make it. So he's got paraquat, he's got dual, which again is okay because the rice was up, but then he had the metribuzin and the interaction of the paraquat and the metribuzin. So I felt pretty good about it when we left. Uh, known the guy for a long time, and uh, so I, I felt I felt real good about it. Drove off that night. It rained, pretty significant rain, inch plus. Three or four days later, that rice fell over, stone dead. Uh, had seen that in plots before too, uh, with with pre treatments of, of metribuzin. And uh, but you know you you don't know what you don't know what to do. You don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so it's really hard to make a to make a recommendation. And then you replants because you never know what the rate is, you know. And some of these products, you know, dual, for instance, if you survive dual, you're fine. Can you replant into dual? Depends on the rate. Uh, so, so these are all that to say that this is a, a fairly complicated phenomenon that we're dealing with. All right, so this is Ben's data. Ben Lawrence uh, works for Bobby and I, a PhD student. So Ben just he just started this project uh, last summer. We've done it a couple times. Garrett sprayed a lot of these plots for us uh, when, when he worked with us at Stoneville. Uh, we kind of have refined our method uh, of, of the way to do this, and now we've handed it off to Ben because uh, we're doing it a little different than the way uh, Dr. Webster and some of the other guys have done or I've done uh, drift work in the past. So what we've done the the the, liter the weed science literature is, is commonly accepted that the, the rate that's going to occur during a drift event is going to be somewhere between one-tenth and one-one-hundredth of the application rate. So we're not really interested in, in the way the different rates or the way the rice is going to respond to the different rates because we don't know what the rate is. Basically what we want to know, what does paraquat do to rice? What does reflex do to rice? And so on and so forth. So we chose to do one rate and then picked a bunch of different timings ranging from, from spike and rice over there on the, on the left hand side all the way out to PD. Probably going to add another one uh, in there next year based on some stuff we'll talk about in a minute. All right. I showed you the pictures for what happened in the spring of 2015 for us. So this rice was planted on June the 9th. You know, ben, this is a new project for him. He's gung-ho, ready to go. And he was getting a little squirrely about it getting late, and I was getting a little squirrely about it getting late. And, uh, and I told him, I said, man, as long as we don't get a hurricane in October, it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Well, we got a hurricane in October, or the tail end of that hurricane in October. We didn't cut this rice. It's still sitting out there. Uh, blew most of it down. Just a, a, a mess. So I don't have any yield data yet on this. So the injury, it's pretty typical of what we've seen in the past. You get out here to these later timings, and you really don't see it. Be the same thing if this was glyphosate, same thing if it was liberty. You don't see the injury as much later in the year. Uh, so this is that's paraquat 14 days after the application. It's just some pictures, and you can kind of, oh, I got a bad angle. I don't know how good that picture showing up in the back. Uh, really, to me, you know, up here, at, you know, one, two leaf rice, you're going to recover pretty quick from that, uh, as long as you don't kill the growing point. This one looks really bad because you can start to get more vegetation. This one can be just, just real nasty. But at that point, seven days post flood. All right, if, you, if you've done any rice work, full rice at all, seven days post flood, you've got however many pounds of nitrogen you just dropped on the ground, you put water on it, everything is going as fast as it can possibly go at that point in the season. That one looks bad because the rice is growing so fast, but because the rice is growing so fast, it grows out pretty quick. And this one, this one is what caused our problem. This is why we didn't cut any of the plots, because we waited on that one a week and we shouldn't have waited. 
that never hit it. So 0.3 pints of gramoxone, basically at uh, PD, nothing. All right, so this is first rate. We'll put first rate in because of the, the case we had with the Sonic the previous year. So keep in mind, none of these are mixtures. We can't mix none of this stuff together in our plot. Well, we could, but we didn't want to, because we want to see what, what the individual active ingredients are doing. All right, so different, you got a real drop off here uh, with the response to first rate. What I don't have in here is the root injury with the first rate. Pretty significant amount of root injury uh, with that application. That's 0.06 ounces. So that's a, uh, yeah, that would be six tenths of an ounce of first rate, which would be pretty, you know, pretty high rate of first rate if you were spraying it on soybeans. All right, and you can see uh, a lot of stain loss in those early applications. Really think we would have seen uh, seen some serious yield reductions in the earlier application just because of stain loss in that. All right, so then here's the last one, Flexstar. And I put this in there just to show you that kind of swooping uh, pattern with the injury. A lot of injury out here at the end of the year. Saw that last year in our plots uh, with Flexstar. So that's 2.4 ounces of, of Flexstar. It's not Reflex, that's Flexstar. So it's the, the hotter isomer of Femesifen and would be a, a, a one-tenth of the max rate, so a pint and a half of a uh, a flex star. Yeah, you can't see the other group. All right, so this, I, I put this in from last year. This is yield on the on the plots that we did last year since I didn't have any for this year. Rates are a lot higher. We used a fourth of the X rate uh, in, in the previous year. As I said, we were kind of refining the technique. Yield is a percent of the non-treated. So with Gramoxone, you know, even even at that spike in treatment, we still only cut about 85% of the non-treated. So 15%, and I would expect we didn't cut. Uh, that probably wasn't 200 bushel rice to start with. Uh, I rarely can pull that off in, in my weed control plot. Reflex, not too bad until you start getting out into the later growth stages. Uh, so 21 days after flood, didn't quite push it all the way to jointing, uh, but pretty close to mid-season, pretty significant yield reduction. All right, the other thing we wanted to do uh, that, that Ben's working on for us is all these mixtures. So these are mixed. So everything, every bar on there had one-tenth of three pints of Gramoxone. So three-tenths of a pint of Gramoxone and then three-tenths of, of the Mississippi rate for all of those. So in the case of Lexar, three-tenths of a quart. So whatever that works out to in ounces. Uh, two-tenths of a quart of cotteran, so on and so forth. So what you see on that slide is everything, with the exception of, of canopy and fierce, is a little worse than paraquat by itself. So that orange bar down there, that's just the straight paraquat, and then everything else is paraquat plus the, the, the label down there on, on the x-axis. So nothing really stands out. This is 14 days after application except the Lexar which again is the three-way combination. If you take that out to 28 days, the Corvus really shows out. Actually, the Lexar and the Corvus flip at, at 28 days. Corvus, if you're not familiar with it, it's got a HPPD herbicide in it, it's got a soxifluidal in it, but it also has a really stout ALS herbicide. And I figured probably the ALS is the one that, that was causing the problems there. Uh, and just draw your attention to the the Gramoxone versus the Gramoxone plus Lexar. That picture, the picture may look worse here than here, but it was a lot worse, you know, if you if you zoomed out. But we uh, we did the close-up pictures there because of the, the growth stage. All right, so didn't have yield, but this should tell you all you want to know. This is the delay in maturity. So this is the day's delay relative to our non-treat. Paraquat, 12 days. The best, the best we had was 11 days with Paraquat and Fierce. All right, Fierce, if you're not familiar with it, it's Valor and Zidua. Zidua is safe on post-emergence on rice. Valor, eh, you can get away with it. Uh, you, wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to make a habit out of it, but it's not the worst thing you can get on your rice. So, so a lot of what you see in there is the influence of the Paraquat. 
So basically, 11 to 15 day delay in maturity. So you're looking at two weeks plus delay in maturity from an application that was made three weeks after emergence. Uh, so, so a lot of carryover, say carryover, that's probably not a good word for a weed scientist to use, but uh, carries over to the end of the year uh, for sure. Is there any plant hives different since at the end of the year? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so it was a stunning process? Yeah, yeah, you can pick them out. You can drive down the road and pick them out. All right, so I mentioned, I mentioned uh, a little bit about this earlier. This is what we don't know. In the Mississippi Delta, and I don't know how it is where y'all are from, but in the Mississippi Delta, starting about July the 25th, you see that one after the other, after the other, after the other, till you got big blocks of soybeans that are burned down, or I say burned down, desiccated or paraquat. Now, just a soapbox moment. Why an airplane pilot will put paraquat in his airplane in July and fly from one end of the delta to the other, but would not consider putting it in his airplane the first of April is beyond me. But they do. Uh, drives me crazy. So, I put this picture in here. Bobby and I, in all of our experience with this, and we've looked at it as much as anybody has, we call this paraquat. But, I'm not 100% sure it's paraquat. Just to, to give you an idea of the, the way this set up, this is right on the high, side of Highway 61 in Bowl. Alright. To the west of this field is a neighborhood. To the south of this field is a neighborhood. To the east of this field is Highway 61 and all the industrial stuff that's right there along Highway 61. The closest soybean field is behind the grain elevator east of the highway. So it's it probably at least a quarter of a mile with a bunch of buildings before you get to this rice field. But we couldn't make it to be anything but that. It didn't come from the south and the west because of the way it laid in in the trees around the neighborhood. If it came from anywhere, it had to come from the east, but it was even across the whole field. It was on the weeds, you know, coffee beans and stuff that were in the ditch. So we called it paraquat. But you, you can't see, you take, but you take this spot right here, some of this can start looking like blast. All right, and we've had some varieties that we've had a serious problem with blast on the last couple of years. So we, we had this on, on, on most of our plots as well. Fairly certain it was drift because we know uh, one of the guys down the road had, had desiccated some beans. So we're going to add a timing in next year on beans. Uh, I, I don't think that's enough to hurt anything, but you've got a range of maturity of rice out there too uh, when the soybeans are getting desiccated. Now, that's it. We can talk about anything else y'all want to. What time is it? Oh, we got plenty of time. Is there any regulation coming on any of that stuff? Not that I'm aware of. I didn't mean to dog. If there's anybody associated with the ag pile, I didn't. Sorry about that. But that's, that, is, that does get frustrating. Well, what's frustrating is you'll spray Roundup on the bean field right by a rice field, but you. Yeah, yeah no, we can't go to the. Yeah, man, we. We get a little bit of regimen on your soybeans every once in a while. But I will say, for us, we get a lot more paraquat and glyphosate on rice than what we do going the other direction. Uh, we're a small state. I mean, we had, you know, we, we've had less than 200,000 acres of rice for three or four years. Uh, so we don't have the big blocks of rice like they do on the prairie, like they do in, in South Louisiana. And, and probably in some of y'all's areas up there too, Amy. But we don't. We we we've got some big blocks of rice, uh, but we also will inevitably end up with a 60-acre rice field that's got soybeans on four sides of it. Uh, and that guy's screwed. I mean, just he's eventually going to get hit. He he. You the odds of you growing out a rice crop with soybeans on all four sides in the Mississippi Delta is pretty pretty low. 
you know, and then, then you just perennially talk to guys that just talk about the glyphosate in the air. I, I don't know how you measure that. Uh, we've got some anecdotal things about, you know, rice fields that are surrounded by woods yielding a lot better than the same variety planted the same day, da, da, da. That's, you know, outside, the, you know, these are usually you know, like national forest or, or state park, stuff like that. Uh, he and Bobby would lambast me for saying and made a comparison to two fields down the road. Uh, they, I mean, they, but you talk, you talk to a lot of guys about that. They, 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 they're just convinced there's glyphosate in the air. We did a, we sprayed some strips for the uh, state plant board. You were, there. we did that in 2013. Uh, so we sprayed a strip of rice. This is right behind the drill. We sprayed a strip of rice with Roundup and a strip of rice with Roundup and Command. And when the rice came up, you know, two, three leaf. The plant board inspector came and pulled samples out of both of those. He found glyphosate in both samples. Didn't come out of the soil for sure because the glyphosate chemistry doesn't allow that. Uh, our plots look, I mean, we didn't, we didn't notice anything out of the ordinary on our plot, but there was enough glyphosate in there that it made it above the, the detect level. So what's the answer then, Jason? What do you think should be done? Oh, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll quote. I'll quote Doctor Webster. I want you to quote Jason Bond. No, no, this is a much better. This is much more eloquent than what I could ever come up with. Doctor Webster of the LSU Ag Center, who's here somewhere, says that as soon as Roundup starts killing cotton, then we'll do something about it. And he's referencing the 2,4-D killing cotton for, for so many years and the, the regulations that got put in place on, on 2,4-D applications. I think, Anthony, I think we better get it together because with the, the, the technologies in the row crops, you did, if you're not a rice farmer, this ain't your problem. But everybody's some kind of farmer, and those technologies are going to are going to carry on carry over across crops. So, what we've always said is you've got to get together with your neighbors and communicate about who's growing what where, so you can get a big block of rice, or a big block of extend soybeans, or a big block of endless cotton. You know, so so you can manage things more than just on your farm, if it, even if it's still locally, but you get some big blocks of stuff. That's the only way I know to to help the problem. But, you know, I talked to a guy this morning, you know, he didn't want to put out, he didn't want to put out any lead off because he wasn't 100% sure he wasn't going to plant cotton. And so, you know, you don't know, so at the last minute, you know, we'll, we'll come up and, and swap crops. I mean, that, that happens year in and year out on everybody's farm. So there's just I don't know of any way good way to do it. Uh -oh. But if you get a big block, then the guy on the outside he's gonna have a block on one side of him. He's got the same yeah. problems with the guy next to him. And look, the other thing, and I said that about the airplanes with the paraquat, because all that desiccant, most of that does go with the airplane. Most of that stuff on on the the drift on the rice. Majority of that's going out with ground readings. That's not going out with airplanes. None of that paraquat's going out with airplanes, I guarantee you. Not in spring on us. Some of the Roundup does. Uh, and depending on the year, you know, that you go back to the 2006 year, yeah, a bunch of that went out with an airplane because as soon as it quit raining, they loaded up those planes and started, started spraying. Uh, well, I think that in the last three years is a lot of the, the environmental yeah, yeah, beans. for for sure. You the soybeans burn down right the, now. The, you can't wait on the right wind or whatever you got to go. The, the incidence of rice dying due to drift is a lot tight with the weather pack. If you got if you got two weeks of bad weather, well, more than likely me and Bobby are going to spend the next two. Well, it'll probably be a week off, and then you know but the second, third week after that, we're going to be looking at dead rice or sick rice at least. Oh. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's not. This is not an aerial application issue. This is just an application issue. Most of it, I say most of it, a lot of it's coming out of ground. Jeez. 
So when you know your field's been drifted on, what's the best thing for you to do to manage that rice field for the rest of the year? We got that in, Ben's got that in the study. Yeah, yeah, we're doing it. We've done a lot of that kind of stuff with glyphosate drift and liberty drift and new path drift. None of it really, you know, we've used all kind of snake oil, fertilizers, anything under the sun. There, there, one, there is no cure. You're not going to get it back to where it was pre-drift event. Rules of thumb, if, if you hadn't started tillering yet, then you're probably money ahead riding it out. You're probably going to flush once, which I know is a hideous thing for me to stand up here and say, but you're probably going to flush it once. You're probably going to spray it at least one more time. And you're probably going to put an extra fertilizer application on it. So you add all of that up versus starting over, you know, going, purchasing seed, which, you know, is going to vary hugely from conventional rice to clear field hybrid rice. And, and but then any management you've got into it to that point, repeating that, and then you look at our planting date data, and after about the 15th, 20th of May, we drop quickly. If it's early, we got some we got some wiggle room. Uh, but like you said, you don't know how much material is out there. You don't. It's replanting it is yeah. a gamble. If, if you can if you can figure out what actually hit it, then then you know if it's if it's if it's the wrong combination of active ingredients, it's a big big time gap. You know, you you you're lucky if it's you know paracot and sharp or, or you know, something that that's got some that rice has got some tolerance to, uh, but most of the time it's going to have something that's Rice don't like a whole lot. Have you even thought about if, if you got a rice field and you used a pre, let's say for man, because I had this three years ago in the boot hill, and it got hit with paraquat and you could trace it around where it moved to the field. So outside of that, command had no effect on the rice. But where it got hit is like the rice plant was trying to metabolize the paraquat for uptake of command, even enhance it even more. Now, I've seen it the other way, seeing saw this last year, pretty cool, wet, fair amount of command injury, rate was a little high, and then we had a, a roundup and select, drifted across, really whacked some corn, just, just, just hammered some corn, but it came on across that rice field too, and then the rice grew back just real, it, it, it grew back in the drift plume, or it did, you could see the drift plume, you couldn't see it, where you could see it on the corn, you knew it went on across there because you could see it in the corn right across the rice field. Then when it started growing back is when you could really see the plume going across the rice field because it didn't grow back as quick. So that was a that was the flip flop of what you're describing. It was sick to start with, and we know that going back to to you know 05, 06, where New Path, you know, guy sprays New Path, whole field dies. Well, you know, New Path killed my rice. Well. Yeah, it did, but but really, it died in a drift pattern because it had glyphosate that hit it the week before. The symptoms hadn't started showing up yet, uh, and then the, it, it just overloads the plant. You yeah. can't take it off. All right, I think we got to shut her down.